Good morning. Thanks for being in Bible class this morning. It is time for us to get started. I do have two updates for you from the bulletin. I uh, wanted to make you aware of two, two more prayer requests. Um, Jackson and Caitlin Baker, as well as Caroline and Jacob, all four have COVID. They are at home with that. They've got some fever, but, uh, but doing okay. But they asked to be put on the prayer list. Certainly want to remember all of them uh, as they go through that. And um, also Laverne Thomason is at home. Sharon messaged us yesterday. She's had some trouble with her legs, just not able to stand right now. They're not sure what's going on, but want her added to the prayer list as well. So we certainly want to remember that. Uh, Laverne is one of our oldest members and one of our shut-ins now, but, but want to keep her in our prayers. Those are two updates that I've got. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Holy God, you know us. Know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you this morning, we know that we come before our Creator. Fathers, we stand before your throne. We are in awe of your majesty. And then to feel your love surround us. We are amazed that you love us, God. Thank you for that. Father, as we come in this morning, there are many on our hearts, so much going on. Father, we pray in our world that you would be with world events, that you would, you would help leaders to seek peace and wisdom. And Father, for those who are recovering from disasters, we pray that, that you would be with the helpers. Bless those who are working to reach out and help and make a difference. Father, here locally on our own prayer list, there are many that we are mindful of, those who are dealing with immediate problems and short-term illness and injury, we pray for their healing, those who deal with more long-term battles. Father, we pray that you would be with them through their treatments, that you would give them strength. We're especially mindful this morning of the Baker family as they deal with COVID. We know lots of folks are sick right now. We pray that you would bless the Bakers as they seek to heal and get through this time. Father, we also pray that you would be with Laverne, be with Sharon as she cares for her, give them wisdom about what's going on and how they can work to, to fix that. Father, we pray that you would strengthen her. And Lord, each of us has people that we're mindful of who are hurting and suffering and struggling, and we pray that your hope and your light could fill their lives and that we could be a force for good. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we're thankful for the Bible, thankful for the way it gives us insight into Jesus and who he is and how he lived and how we can live. As we study the gospel this morning, we pray for an open heart. We pray for the courage to examine our own lives, to be able to live more like Jesus every day. And Father, also as we look at the life Jesus lived and see how people treated him and see the world then and look at our world today, we are reminded that this world is broken and that we are not in heaven yet and we look forward to what you have promised so, Father, help us to strain forward, to reach for that prize that you have called us to do. Guide us each and every day. Help us to be your people and your presence in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. We left off in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus has been challenged on his authority. Who are you? Who do you, you know, by what authority do you say these things? And who gave it to you? And he's responded to that. And if you remember early on, he was challenged excuse me, by a group of Pharisees. And now we've seen the Pharisees and the, the Herodians and they've come together and they asked him there in verse 15 and following, teacher, they said, we know that you are a true, that you are true and that you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. They begin to flatter him and they said things that were all true. There's only one problem with what they said. What's that? They were wrong? What do you mean, John? John says they were wrong in the way they approached it. So the words they said are all true. Jesus is true. He does teach the way of God. He does teach it with no regard for, for who he's standing before. He, he's not impressed by the, the mighty and powerful. He doesn't bow down to them. He, he doesn't cater to the weak and powerless either. He, he teaches the truth irrespective of who he's there. So they spoke true words, but John said they were wrong. They didn't, they didn't believe what they said. Jesus is going to reveal that in just a moment. And, and they ask him a question. So in verse 17, they said, tell us therefore what you think, because you're so great. 
Jesus and so wise and so good. Tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, they ask him, is it lawful? So let me ask you, is it lawful to pay taxes? Yeah, yeah, we're coming up on that. Yeah. Not only is it lawful, it's required by the law. And it was in Roman law as well. That's not the question that they asked Jesus. When they said, is it lawful, they weren't asking, is it Roman law to pay Roman taxes? Of course it was. What do they mean by, is it lawful? What law would they be talking about? Jewish law. In fact, uh, one of the, the, the there are some Jewish translations of the New Testament, and, and these are folks who are believers in Jesus but have a Jewish background. And sometimes their wording on things gives us a little insight, especially in a situation like this. One of those Jewish New Testaments translates this verse: "Is it Torah to pay taxes to Caesar?" Torah is the word for those first five books of the law. It's the, the word that summarizes Moses' law. Is it in keeping with God's law to pay taxes to Caesar? Why wouldn't it be Torah to pay taxes? What case could they hope to make against Roman taxes? Yeah, those taxes went to the Roman government. The Roman government had an established state religion of what we would call paganism. The Roman pantheon was supported by the tax money. So is it lawful for us to give to a government that supports a false religion? They could have gone farther than that. Roman law specifically allowed things that God prohibited it prohibited things that God commanded, and, and Jews had fought against that and, and wrestled with that through so much. Is it lawful to give taxes to a government that isn't godly? More than that, and we're, we're going to see in, in just a moment, it, it come into uh, real crystal clear clarity, but uh, why is it that you paid your taxes to the Roman emperor because he was God. Rome believed that the emperor ruled by the will of the gods, but even more than that, that becoming emperor made you one of the gods. They worshipped the emperor. And one of the ways you showed your respect for the divine emperor was you paid him taxes. Incidentally, we've already run into this in a godly way. Remember Peter? Does your master not pay the temple tax? And Peter's like, of course he pays the temple tax. Everybody pays the temple tax. And we talked then about that temple tax. And, and remember, Jesus explains to Peter, oh, look, I'm the son of God. I don't have to pay the temple tax, but we're not going to give offense. So go catch a fish, pull a coin out of its mouth, and you'll pay my tax and yours. Jews loved paying the temple tax. They were proud to pay the temple tax. It was a statement of their national pride to say, I'm a Jew and I gladly support the work of God. They, they considered it a point of honor to pay the temple tax because it was in its own way an act of worship. Now when you consider how Jews felt about paying the tax that went to the temple, you see a little bit of how Rome felt about paying taxes. Nobody loves taxes even then. But it was your civic duty. You were a Roman citizen. You were part of the Roman government. It was considered an act of worship to the Roman emperor. Alan? Who did the Jews follow? Did they follow Moses or who? The Jews followed God. They, they would have been really clear on that. The, the Shema that they say every day, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. So Moses was God's lawgiver. And that actually becomes a really critical point in all of this. What Moses says matters because he, he gave them those first five books of the law. He wrote them down at God's instruction. But, but they say, is it Torah to pay Roman taxes? You know what? That's kind of an act of worship of the Roman emperor. We're opposed to so much in the Roman government. We don't want the Roman government to succeed. They're oppressing us right now. Is it lawful to pay taxes and notice, by the way, they don't even say to the Roman governor. What do they say? 
to Caesar. And maybe that is kind of their subtle way of saying this is that act of emperor worship. And they think they have laid the perfect trap. They've buttered Jesus up. You're so wise. Just give us an answer. What happens? What's the trap here? What if Jesus says, yes, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? What's, what's the trap? Yeah, so many, this is a hot button issue. This is a political issue that is widely debated. And the majority of Jews hated the Roman tax. And so if Jesus sided with that, they would have said, oh, so you worship the emperor as God, do you? Oh, so you believe in the Roman government and everything it does and everything it teaches. You endorse the Roman government, Jesus? And they would have alienated him from the people. What happens if Jesus says, no, it's not Torah to pay taxes to the Roman government? Pitted him against Caesar. There would have been Roman guards waiting just outside to arrest him for treason. We don't take kindly to folks who say, don't pay your taxes, right? Ask Al Capone. When we can get you on tax evasion, it's a big deal. Every government imposes taxes, and they take it seriously. When they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, They've got, they say, we've got him. He can't say yes, and he can't say no, which, by the way, they feel like this might be payback for earlier when Jesus asked them, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they're like, we can't say either one. They've, we've come up with a question for him. We can't say either one. He can't say either one. The Roman poll tax that was imposed was imposed upon every single male from age 14 to age 65. You could age out of taxes in the Roman government, by the way. But after age 65, you didn't have to pay that. But it was only levied on occupied territories. So if you were a natural-born Roman citizen, this was a tax you didn't pay. You had other taxes, but this one you didn't pay. It was only for occupied territories. So the Jews hated it. And it was more resented than anything else. It emphasized Rome's right to rule. It was that act of worship. And so the question of whether or not it was okay to pay the tax was a burning issue. From the rise of Herod until the fall of the Jewish state, in fact, about 100 years after Jesus' time, the Bar Kokhba revolt is inspired strictly by the poll tax. Bar Kokhba raises up the Jews and leads a revolt against Rome just on the poll tax. And so they, they ask Jesus this trick question. And verse 18 says, but Jesus perceived, I love Matthew, Jesus perceived their wickedness. Not their craftiness. They're not crafty. They're not going to trap him. But their wickedness. Jesus knew that they were testing him. He's going to say that in just a minute. But he, he perceives, he sees their heart. As man is incapable of doing, man can only look on the outside. But God knows the heart. Jesus, as God, can see their heart in this matter. And he knows exactly what's going on. And so he, he doesn't answer their question at first. In fact, he answers their question with a question. Why do you test me? Why, why do they test him? They want to catch him in a trap. But what leads to this constant testing? They're opposed to him. They have decided what they believe. Teresa says he threatens their authority and their power, and that's exactly right. They have already decided what they believe about Jesus. That's why they keep testing him. Because they don't believe him. Why do you test me? And then he says, you hypocrites. You say one thing, Jesus, you're great and wise and good and all that, but, but you don't practice it. You don't really believe it. You hypocrites. And then he says, show me the tax money. So they brought to him a denarius. Now, real quickly, let me give you just the, the briefest, uh, let, let's understand what they were looking at. Because when they bring a denarius, that was everyday money. And if, if I were to say, hey, let, let's do a lesson on money, and I held up the money. I said, what, would you, what do you know is written? Whatever bill or coin you have, every bit of money we mint in the U.S., what do you know is written on there? 
Yeah, in God we trust. Yeah, you, you know that. That's part of, we're familiar with our money. And, and if I begin to tell you, how, you know, different people that are pictured on different bills, you, you would know some about that. And we, We're familiar with our money. We're not familiar with their money. A denarius was a coin that they would use all the time. It was a regular daily coin. And it would have borne the inscription of Caesar. Either Augustus or Tiberius, those are the two coins that were in use at the time. And so Jesus says, show me the tax money. They bring him a denarius. In verse 20, he said, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now we use that term an awful lot, but it's actually a, a family name. In, in good Latin culture, Roman culture, you had three names. And it's not like first, middle, and last like we think of. You have your first name, which is your given name. That's yours uniquely. Your second name is your family name. That's what we would call our, our surname. Uh, they called it the pronomen. And, and it was your, your family name. It identified what family you were from. So for me, that would be David Salisbury. And then you had a third name. For a lot of people, this was a nickname. If you read through Roman history, you can find a Scavola. And that would probably be one that, that people would have called me. David Salisbury Scavola. Scavola means left-handed. So, yeah, that's lefty. David Salisbury Scavola. You, you might find one. Uh, there's a fellow we read about, and his, his third name, that cognomen, is Balbus. He's the Lisper. That's the guy that nobody, you know, it's just the nickname. There, there's tall, there's short, there's speedy, there's all kinds of nicknames. But if you came from a really well known family, that would be your cognomen. You know, sometimes because uh, last names change through marriages, maybe you don't still carry that name, but you're, you want to tell everybody I'm of that family. Caesar was just such a name. And so Gaius Julius Caesar was named Gaius. His family name was Julius, but he belonged to the house of Caesar. And so his full Latin name was Gaius Julius Caesar. You know him as Julius Caesar. It's funny, we drop his uh, first name. And, and he became the first emperor. And, and folks after him were in his family. And so their cognomen, that third name, was Caesar. And gradually it stopped referring to the house of Caesar, the family, and it began to refer to the emperor. And so you could call every single emperor Caesar, regardless of what, ha what family he was from, what house he was in. So that third name became a title. And we're in that period of transition. These folks are still family to Gaius Julius Caesar, but now you can just refer to the emperor as the Caesar. And that word is becoming significant or synonymous with the emperor and just a title for the Roman emperor. Augustus is currently the ruling emperor. If it is Augustus that is pictured on this coin, Augustus's denarius specifically said that he was Augustus Caesar, son of the divine. It called him the, the son of God. Um, sorry, Augustus was emperor when Jesus was born. That one would have said son of God. By this time, Augustus is gone. Tiberius is the Caesar in Jesus' ministry. I apologize. And, and, and it would have said Tiberius Caesar Augustus. Tiberius, who is a Caesar, he's the son of Augustus. And it does say that he is the son of the divine. He's the one. The flip side of that predicted a, a seated woman. And that seated woman is usually identified as Tiberius' mother, Livia. But underneath that, it wrote, High Priest. You can see how the Jews would be offended by this. One side of the coin says, Tiberius, son of the divine. The other side of the coin says, here's my mom. She's the high priest. The high priest of what? The high priest of the cult that worships the emperor. And so as they bring this coin to Jesus... There's a lot going on with that coin. He says, show me the tax money. And they brought him a denarius. And he said, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Just take a moment and look at the first half of what he says. By the way, he's going to answer the question. But in so doing, he answers in a way that sidesteps all of the problems they thought they'd set up. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Is it okay to pay taxes to Rome? But Rome supports, has state-funded pagan religion. Is it okay to pay taxes to Rome? 
Okay, good. I was going to say, you guys knew the answer just a minute ago. Yes, it's okay to pay taxes. To Rome. But, but Rome oppresses the Jewish people, God's people. Rome is the one who has brought so much pain and suffering to all of us. Is it still okay to pay taxes to Rome? What does it mean when a good, God-fearing Jew pays taxes to Rome? He's obeying the government and nothing more. He doesn't have to agree with the government. It doesn't mean I would make all the exact same decisions as Caesar if I were Caesar. It doesn't mean I endorse every position the Roman government takes. That giving them my money doesn't mean I embrace everything that they stand for. That giving them my money means I can honor a secular government without compromising my faith in God. That's a pretty powerful statement that Jesus just made. And much bigger than the question they asked. Is it, is it Torah to pay our taxes? We'd love to get out of paying taxes. And Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. What else does it mean about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's? It means it doesn't really matter. Jesus almost treats it as trivial. Yeah, pay your taxes to Caesar. And they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> You mean we could, yeah, pay your taxes to Caesar. Why would Jesus view paying taxes to Rome and to Caesar as trivial? I wish he had. <laughs> that might be a tax argument more than a theological argument, though, Teresa. Yeah. But Jesus says, if you, give, if you take that denarius and you go pay your taxes with it, you haven't affected your standing with God doesn't matter you haven't changed what's important in your life so yes give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar it's lawful to do and he says but let's let's stop for a minute you owe Caesar a tax Leland So Jesus doesn't dig into that, but you're exactly right, and you see that happen in, in the Bar Kokhba revolt and in future. If you couldn't hear Leland, he says, but wouldn't not paying your taxes to Caesar then begin to affect your status and, and, and what you owe? And, and yes, according to what Paul's going to say about government, and, and Paul's real specific when he gets into government, he says, you owe your taxes. But Jesus says, let's think about this for a minute. You owe your taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. What else do you owe? And he says, you know you owe this to Caesar. He shows his dominion, his authority over this area because he puts his image on that coin. And it's a demonstration of his power and his sovereignty as emperor. And Jesus says, so you give to Caesar what he claims as his. And you give to God what he claims as his. How do we know that coin belongs to Caesar? It bears his image. Jesus is not approving of the idolatrous claims of the Roman government or even the claims on the coin concerning Caesar. Only that God is worthy of our honor because we bear his image. Jesus says, let's make a much bigger point out of this. You want to argue about paying taxes. I'm going to make a point from that about how you treat secular government. And then I'm going to show you what really matters in your life. There's a place for government. It's appropriate for government to, to levy taxes and to do what God has called government to do. They need funding and all of that. But you know what? God put his image on this earth. And he did it so that he would be honored. And, and Leland asks, what happens if you don't pay your taxes? Boy, they knew. Failure to pay your taxes? Failure to pay what is due the emperor? Oh, you'd be in big trouble. What happens if you fail to pay what you owe to God as his image bearer? What happens if you fail to honor God with your life? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things that are, or to God the things that are God's. 
To God belongs all honor and glory and dominion. Jesus says, I am the son of God. And they said, we refuse to recognize you. In other words, we will not pay what we owe to God. He said, how do you think God's going to handle that? If you know what Caesar does when you don't pay taxes, imagine what God does when you refuse to give him the honor and glory that's due him. And certainly that shows most clearly in how they treat Jesus, but he makes it even bigger than that. Jesus is the presence of God, the Son of God right there. But he specifically asks, whose image is this? In that scenario right there, in that crowd, if they said, okay, the coin bears the image of Caesar, and Jesus had said, who bears the image of God? Who is it in the crowd that bears the image of God? Everyone, yeah. It's not just Jesus. This is bigger than how they treat him. It's how they treat people, period. You have failed to give honor to God when you have failed to treat each human being you meet as the image of God. I didn't know that our Bible class time and the sermon time were going to coincide on this week exactly, but uh, you are getting a little bit of a preview of Sunday morning's lesson here. Because when God set up the Ten Commandments, number one, you will have no other gods before me. What's number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's when Jesus says the two greatest commandments. But in the Ten Commandments, commandment number one, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Israel. You shall have no other gods before me. And then he says, you shall not make what? A graven image. You guys learned it in King James like I did. Yeah. You, you shall not make a carved image. You, you, you shall not make an image of God. And for a long time when I read that and studied that, I always thought the reason you couldn't make a carved image of God is because... You can't do it justice. If you said God is as strong as a bull, and so you made God into an image of a bull like the Israelites did there with the golden calf, well, maybe you've captured something of the strength of God, but it fell short, and it fails to address, are you saying God's as dumb as a bull, that he can be domesticated by, you know, your image falls short. Well, if you say, well, no, he's like, He's like Baal. He, he's the fly god. He can go anywhere. That was part of Baal's imagery was Baal was like a house fly. You say, why would you worship a house fly? You ever tried to stop one? Baal's unstoppable. He's everywhere. Yeah, but are you saying God's annoying and a pest? And the, whatever image you create. And very quickly as you look at the images of pagan gods, they, they move from one image to, well, now we're going to combine. So it's like part elephant and part, part bull and part eagle. You still fall short. I always thought God said, don't make a graven image of me because whatever you make, it won't accurately capture who I am. It will fall short. God never said that. That was David's interpretation. And, and, and that's true. You can't make an image that fully captures God. But I think there's something even more basic to his command. You can't make an image of God because he already made an image of himself for the world to see. You see all these pagan religions, they said, oh, here's our God, and we've got to create a little idol for you to carry around so you can see what our God looks like. And Jehovah God said, I've already made my image. I put it all over the world. You're it. You can't make an image because I made an image already. I put my image everywhere. Every person you look at is the image of God. Render unto God the things that are God's. You're created in his image. What do you owe God? Your life, everything. You breathe his air, your heart beats because he created it to work just that way. You owe God everything. You owe him your honor and your allegiance. Pay your taxes to Caesar, but give your life to God. And he hits these Pharisees right in the heart of what they're really after. We want the power. Teresa they challenges their power and their authority. We want that power and authority. And they were in this big struggle with the Sadducees to see who could have more power and authority. The Herodians that we read about, they're not even a religious party. They're really a political party. But they affected the mix. So, you know, we're, we're trying to see who's really in charge. And Jesus says, wait a minute. God is really in charge. And you failed to realize that. 
And they get it. Verse 22, when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The Pharisees and the Herodians are beaten. They leave. That same day, we're still on Tuesday of this week before Jesus dies. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said, now let's get who we're talking about here. Sadducees are the ruling party. They are a minority party. They don't have the numbers, but they control the temple. The priests are almost all Sadducees. Lots of the scribes are Sadducees. The high priest always came from the Sadducee party as often as they could get him there. The Sanhedrin was split, but the the temple was run by the Sadducees. They only accepted the first five books as inspired. Now, they liked the rest. They weren't like Samaritans who denied the rest of the Old Testament. But they said from Joshua all the way to the end, that's some good material. But only the Torah is truly inspired. So they could disagree with Joshua through Malachi, and and it was okay. It had good stuff in it, but you didn't have to follow it like you did Genesis to Deuteronomy. Moses was their hero. And so they, they claim there's no resurrection of the dead. There's nothing in the Torah, those five books, that talks about life after death, so they didn't believe in it. And they come to him, verse 24, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. They're citing this principle called leveret marriage. It was laid out by by Moses, uh, alluded to anyway in Deuteronomy chapter 25. What it meant was land, the blessing that God had given Israel, was passed down through the family from father to son. And so if a man dies with no children, he lost his share. His family would lose that share of the inheritance that God had given them. They said, that's not right. And so in a culture where polygamy was still practiced, in this case, it's a situation where for the protection of the woman and the family, his brother would take, that wife, would take his brother's wife in, make her part of the family, marry her, would provide her with a child, and that child would carry on in the dead brother's name and could receive the inheritance. It was a way that family took care of family. And it's pretty foreign to us and how we think of uh, inheritance as well as how we think of family taking care of each other. But it was the law. In fact, so much so that that if you go back and look uh, in the Old Testament, Judah's son Onan was punished to death by God because he refused to take care of his brother's wife. When his brother died, Onan did not want to take care of family and God punished him with death. It was that serious. So they said, here's the law. If a man dies, his brother is supposed to take care of his wife, the the widow. And that includes providing an heir. And then they get ridiculous. Verse 25. Now there were with us seven brothers. And the first died after he'd married, having no offspring. So the next brother in line does what he's supposed to do. Uh, Having no offspring, left his wife to his brothers. Likewise, the second. In other words, the second brother died, producing no offspring. And the third. And the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. So this poor woman goes through all seven brothers, and all seven brothers die, and she has no children. In verse 27, last of all, the woman died also. So they've set up a pretty absurd scenario. Here's this woman, and she's gone through all seven brothers, been married to each of them, and finally she dies. And they said in verse 28, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Now, I told you this was a culture that practiced polygamy. And you can go back and read in your Old Testament about uh, great people in the Bible and other situations where a a man had multiple wives. They understood and embraced me. But they they didn't have any room for polyandry. That's a woman with multiple husbands. So they said, here's this good, faithful Jewish man, and he dies. His brother steps in and does what a brother's supposed to do and marries the widow. And then he dies and all seven of them married her. And then she dies and they're all faithful. So they all go to this mystery place you call heaven in this crazy life after death thing that some folks believe in. That's how the Sadducees would have put it. What's her marital status in heaven? She's got seven husbands. And they're all in heaven up there with her. Maybe this is a question that they had used with the Pharisees. That was an ongoing debate. 
Maybe they'd confounded them with them. But Jesus, as he does so well, he addresses the, the root of the problem. And this time, by the way, he doesn't call them hypocrites. This was one of those tests that they used all the time. They believed in this argument. And so Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. You are in error. There's a logical flaw in your thinking. He said, actually, you have two logical flaws. You are in error. You are mistaken. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Jesus said, you've got two problems with your thinking. Number one, you don't know the scriptures. And number two, you don't know God. You don't understand God. And so he says, verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. He addresses them in the, the opposite order. He says, life in heaven, it doesn't look like life on earth. You've assumed that life in heaven looks just like life on earth. Do you have to lock your doors in heaven? <laughs> Teresa says, yeah, Teresa says, if you have to, I don't know how it works up there. I don't know if we got doors. I don't know if we got locks. Life in heaven is not like life on earth. To assume that life in heaven is exactly like life on earth is a false assumption. Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. When you step into God's eternal kingdom in heaven, it's not like life on earth. And he says they neither marry nor are given in marriage, referring to those two roles. A, a man marries, a woman is given in marriage by her father usually. And he says that doesn't happen in heaven. And he says that, that relationship is different. And then he says they will be like the angels of God in heaven. Man, this verse is given all kinds of, of crazy ideas. Jesus never says that when you die, you become an angel. I don't care what country music says. You don't die and wake up and spread your wings and fly across heaven. And that's not how it works. You don't become an angel. Your relationships become spiritual, just like the angels do. Angels don't marry. They don't have families. They don't reproduce. We won't have baby showers in heaven. There's not new life being created like that. And he says, so in heaven, marriage is not like what you think it is on earth. Other New Testament passages confirm our resurrection body, our future state is different. It doesn't mean that there will just be little spiritual blue lights floating around and we won't know anything. That's not it. But he simply says life is different and you don't understand how much being in the presence of God will change everything about your relationships. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. There, there's no need for the marriage relationship like that, like there is on earth. And he said, but let's get to your real question, because you're not really asking about marriage. You're really asking about life after death. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, and he quotes here from the Torah, he quotes literally from what God said to Moses at the burning bush. Now, they loved Moses and they loved the Torah. So he quotes some scriptures that they reverenced and respect. And they said, well, the Torah never addresses life after death. And he said, did you not read what God said? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They're like, yeah, that's what God said to Moses. By the way, Jesus gives us a quick little class on Bible study here. Don't miss this. Jesus says, didn't you read and understand what was in the Bible? And he teaches us how to read and understand what was in the Bible. And so Jesus is going to say, number one, words are important. He's going to key in on one word in this verse that God uses and said, you should have looked at that word and it should have told you a truth about God. Words are important. Studying the wording that's given in scripture, studying and understanding the word of God is powerful and important. It's worth doing. But he also says theology is important. Didn't you just know God? Didn't you know and understand God's power? Because you didn't, you missed everything in this verse. And he says, here's the verse you should have looked at. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he says, God is not the, the God of the dead, but of the living. What word does he key in on in that passage? I am, not I was, Mark says. That's it. When 
when God speaks to Moses, we are lots and lots of generations removed from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the patriarchs, that's history. And when you speak of history and people in history, you use the past tense. But God didn't do that. He said, I am the God of Jacob. When is he the God of Jacob? Right now. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, right now. And Jesus said, did you not realize that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must have some type of continued existence at that point? In order for him to say, I am their God right in this moment, could you not see that there is life beyond this life? You should have known that. You should have understood that. And you should have known God well enough to know that he wouldn't say, I'm the God of the past. I used to do great things. I used to have power. Long ago, I said some big stuff. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob why would that have been powerful for Moses to hear in that moment? What's the promise? He's just gotten done saying, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and confront Pharaoh. And Moses said, I tried. It didn't work out too well. I'm not the guy. I can't do this. And he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why is that encouraging? There's a promise, yeah, there's a promise that I made to them that's still valid. Teresa says also, it doesn't end here, there's life after. I'm not just the God of the past, I'm the God who gives you a future. Jeremiah is going to pick up big on that. I know the Sadducees didn't accept Jeremiah, but <coughs> Jeremiah records God's words. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a future. To say that God is an eternal God. To say that he is the God, not of the dead and of the past, but of the living, is to imply that he has the right and the authority to rule today just like he did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because the Sadducees would have said, oh yeah, we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He did some great stuff and he set us all up. He gave Moses those plans, you know, for the tabernacle that became the temple. And now we run the show. God did all that stuff in the past so that we could be here today to be in charge and be in authority. And Jesus says, you've missed the point. God didn't just act in the past to put you in charge. He's still in charge. We're still dealing with this idea of authority that they've been questioning Jesus on all day. By what authority do you say these things and do these things and who gave it to you? And he says, God. The God who is I am. The God who is the God of the living, not just the dead. He's the one who gave me authority. And it's his authority that you reject and refuse to acknowledge. And in so doing, you dishonor him. And you ought to be very concerned about doing that. That's the God. That you've been talking about and you say, oh, well, we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But he told you about it. And you didn't accept his word as authoritative. Verse 33, when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. We've already seen, by the way, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, everybody, they may not listen to the word of, the God, of God, but they sure listen to the will of the people. They're afraid to cross the people. And so as Jesus answers this question and impresses the multitude, they realize he has the authority to speak. And for a moment, we're going to see them back up. Next week, John Fife's going to be teaching class. I'll be at CYC with the youth group. Um, Josh and Emily are staying put this year just in case Roy wants to make an early appearance. So John's going to be teaching next week, and we'll pick up in verse 34 next Sunday. Thanks for being in Bible class this morning.